Now let's talk a little bit, just briefly, about some of the spiritual dynamics in church planting. When we finish this section, we're going to be talking a lot about methods and different ways churches get planted, different ways churches develop, how to understand the people you're ministering to. These are all very practical. But I want to underline at this point, no matter what methods you adopt, ultimately, church planting is a spiritual ministry. And it must be done in dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit. Humanly speaking, we may be able to create some kind of a human institution that meets on Sundays. But only God can really create a true community of believers. And we need to remember that. A couple of points to highlight. Church planting in the power of the Holy Spirit. Nothing could be clear from the book of Acts. Uh, the English title of the book of Acts is the Acts of the Apostles. But the more accurate title would really be the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the Holy Spirit constantly pushing the believers outward. The Holy Spirit constantly empowering the message, touching the hearts of people, performing miracles, and so on. Acts 1.8. Well, even before Acts, at the end of Luke, Jesus tells the disciples, don't go until you've received power from on high. Don't even try it until you've received my power. It's the only way you can do this. And so then in Acts 1.8, Jesus says that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon them and the believers will be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Of course, Peter preaches his Pentecostal sermon in the power of the Spirit. And as the people hear that message, it says they're cut to the heart. In Acts chapter 4, the believers in the face of persecution are filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says they preach the word boldly. In Acts 9.31, it speaks of the Spirit strengthening the churches. In Acts 16, when Paul is trying to discern which way to go, should they go to Bithynia, should they go to Asia, and it says he had this vision of the Holy Spirit blocking this way and blocking that way. It says the Holy Spirit hindered us from going there. And then the vision, the Macedonian vision, to head towards Europe. And so many other uh, passages we could quote where the Holy Spirit performs signs, performs miracles, empowers the message. And the word of God in church planting. Again, the book of Acts is just full of comments about how through the preaching of the word, it was that people come to faith and they're added to the church. And that the early believers were students of the word of God. And an interesting sort of formulation that we find over and again in the book of Acts is that as the church grows, it speaks of the word of God increasing and growing. For example, Acts 6, verse 7, it, um, it says, So the word of God spread, and the numbers of, just, of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And we find this kind of language where the word of God almost takes its own dynamic, as if it was its own, its own messenger. The human messengers are almost secondary. And so church planning has to be done in the power of the Holy Spirit, and it will be based upon the preaching of the word of God, because what did we say? A true church is composed of those who become believers. And it is the gospel that leads people to faith in Christ. And there will be spiritual opposition in church planting. Sometimes it comes in the shape of human beings. Paul faces constantly where he was stoned, he was beaten up, he was accused falsely of things. There was human opposition. There was spiritual opposition where a demon-possessed woman was harassing Paul. And so there, there were principalities and powers he talks about that we come up against. And so church planting will face spiritual opposition and prayer. Prayer and church planting. One of the most wonderful uh, exercises is to study the prayers of Paul. Now you will remember I mentioned that the epistles of Paul that were written to these churches are really missionary letters to these new church plants. But it is just so amazing to listen to the way that Paul prays. 
And so many of his letters are filled with these, these prayers. Uh, usually at the beginning, beginning of Ephesians or Philippians or Colossians, let me read for you, uh, you know, just one of these prayers, the way Paul prays for these new believers. And here he's praying for a church in Colossae that he hasn't even met. He hasn't even been in Colossae. And yet he prays this way. Um, Colossians 1, verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you, asking for God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened in all power according to his glorious might, so that you may have great assurance and patience and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Now that's a prayer. How often have you prayed a prayer like that? He goes to the very heart of the manner that these people are just filled with the knowledge of Christ. Their lives are being transformed, that, that they're, they're growing in their walk with God and in every good work and so on and so forth, all spiritual wisdom. These are rich, rich prayers and that's the way he prays for the churches he plants it's no wonder that these young believers were in a position to to exercise spiritual leadership and grow and plant and lead others to christ at such an early stage so prayer is going to be absolutely essential to doing church planting and then we have this whole tension between what is god's responsibility what is human responsibility. And this comes so beautifully uh, expressed in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. Familiar passage. 1 Corinthians 3, I'll start at verse 5. Paul writes, What after all is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe as the Lord assigned each his task. And so Paul and Apollos What's the big deal about them? They're just servants. But it was through them that they came to believe. As God appointed. So God appoints people to believe, but it's through humans, through Paul and Apollos that that came to be. He says, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. And so we, in the gifts and the abilities God gives us, we, we plant, we water, but just like the farmer, you know, he can plant and he can water, but the, the mystery of a little seed growing into a, a large plant, he says only God can really make that happen. So we as human agents, he says, verse 7, so neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be awarded to according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field and God's building. And so we are fellow workers with God. God is the only one who can grow a church. God is the only one who can strengthen a church. And yet he chooses to work through us as his co-laborers in this process. What a tremendous privilege that is to be a co-laborer with God in his mission, in his building of his church, in his strengthening of his church, in creating kingdom communities that are a sign, an instrument, and a foretaste of the kingdom of God. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at tvsseminary.com. Before moving on to the next section, I did want to give a couple of questions that can be worked on, and you can work on these with a group in your church or at home to begin to think about the implications of, of what uh, we've been teaching so far. And so for this section on biblical foundations, Consider this, how strong is the vision for church planting in your church or movement? 
Is there a vision at all? We've been talking about the practical reasons for church planting, some biblical reasons for church planting, the nature of churches as kingdom communities. How is that vision in your group? And then, of course, the next question is related to that. How can you communicate a biblical vision for church planting? What do you need to do in your church or with your group to move forward to maybe get out of a sense of complacency, a sense that, well, you know, we just kind of keep on doing what we're doing and we'll just grow our own church, to really move the vision to a whole new level, to say we want to actually saturate our city with churches preaching the gospel. How are you going to communicate that vision? I've got a lot of ideas about things can be preached on, about Bible study lessons. One of the best things to do is to just get the facts together and to, to show how many churches there are and how great the spiritual need is, and then bring that together with the biblical vision. And we'll, I'll give you some examples of that later on. But consider taking these two questions and discussing them with your group and praying about them. What is it that God really wants your church to do? How can you help move your congregation forward and the willingness, because it's going to demand sacrifice and vision from not just a few people, but from a whole congregation to reach out and begin to plant new churches. So think about that. 